Welcome to Grace Chapel this morning. As always, we're going to practice community worship with one another, so come on in the back and have a seat. As we move into our time this morning, I want to invite you to go ahead and stand. This is the week. This is the week where we're exploring as a TFC community what it means to join God in the local church. What it means to join God in the local church. One of the things that we're going to talk about today is how the local church is God's design. All right, It's the place that God has designed for each of us to grow into communion with God. And it's designed to be the launching point, the launching pad for getting apart and participating in God's mission in the world. So basically what we're saying is this, that there's no way to really be a Christian unless we're embedded in a local community of Christians where God is shaping His life in us and we are participating in His mission right there in that local setting. So we want to continue to do that this morning. So I invite you to open your hearts and your minds as to what God wants to teach you today. And let's continue our worship as we worship together with song this morning.
the life of the Lord God Almighty. Who walks on the water, the wind and the waves, and every your name. But you pulled my heart right out of the day. Oh, I believe that you. gospel. He's talking about being a servant of that gospel. And as he's speaking to the Ephesians, this is what he says to them as the people of God. He says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through His Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length, the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to Him, who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we can ask or imagine, to Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. I want to invite you to turn to the person on your right or on your left, just to Choose a person, partner up. And in these next few moments, I want to invite you to actually pray with one another. To pray that we, as the body of Christ here at Tacoa Falls College, that we might give ourselves to God in such a way that God might fill us with His knowledge and His love and His redeeming power. Just take a moment right now. Just pray together. If you want to pray silently, if you want to pray out loud, Whatever it is, you pray right where you are for the body of Christ here at TFC.
as you continue to pray with your partner this morning. I want to invite you to transition now that just as we pray for us as the body of Christ here at TFC, would you begin to lift up prayers for the church universal, the church across the world, the body of believers, that they might be filled more and more with the knowledge and the power and the love of God in these coming days. Would you pray for the church universal this morning? Our breath, you are life, you are everything in you is all we need. You're my breath, you're my life, you are everything in you, Jesus, is all we need. You're my breath. my breath, you're my life, you are everything. Amen. Let us continue to pray together. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the work that you've done in Christ. The work that you're continuing to do through the power of your spirit, Lord, to raise up a people who bear witness to you in their speech, telling the world what it is that you're up to, but also, Lord, bear witness to you in the quality of their life, a life that bears witness to the redeeming work of your gospel that also bears witness to what it is that you're doing in the world. God, we long to be your people, your faithful people who truly do relate to you, commune with you, to allow you, O oh God, to produce your life in us as your people. We want to truly be the body of Christ. And we not only pray for ourselves this morning, but for the, the body of Christ universal, that you might help us to proclaim the truth indeed. But by your power, O oh God, to live into the truthfulness, to live truthfully into the power of your gospel so that our very life as your people bears witness to what it is that you're doing and invite the whole world to come and to be a part of that. God, this morning we thank you for your church. We pray that you would continue to shape your church to be your people, the people who share your character and share your mission in this world. Help us, O oh Lord, to do that faithfully. Build up your church anew and afresh today, we pray. Pray this in the, the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, and by the power of your Spirit. In the body of Christ here at TFC, all together we say, Amen. Amen. I invite you to be seated. To, to continue our topic this morning of joining God in the local church, adjunct professor here at Tacoa Falls College, Wesley Rimpicus, also... Yeah, well, come on, come on, Wesley. 
is going to come and he's going to share a message from the Lord to the other for us. Hey, good morning. You guys look good this morning. You do. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Hey, I am really excited to be with you because um, I really love Tacoma Falls College and I really love you people. Um, the whole reason that I have chosen to be at this campus for the last three years, three, four years, is because I just love students. And I love, um, there's something um, that I also love, and it is the local church. My goal in our short time together today is to convince you today to love the local church too, and why it's imperative if you're a Christian, that you join and, and, and do this. That you would embrace the local church to experience God, community, and mission. That you would embrace the local church to best experience God, community, and mission. Apparently, it's college students that is, the, that is most the, the group of Christians disengaged from the church and disenfranchised with the church. And many, even on this campus. But this cannot happen. This cannot happen. For believers to be disengaged and disenfranchised with his church, and not with this group, not with the Tacoa Falls Screaming Eagles. We will not be disenfranchised and disengaged with the church. I've pastored for seven years and am currently part of leading an effort at our church to plant a church about 45 minutes north of us. And especially in church planting, I see that a lot of people are disenfranchised with the church. And, and, under, and understandably so. I mean, I, I hear all the time, um, and, and maybe this is you, you know, th things like, you know, if the church would just, or, or the, the church doesn't, or the, you know, the church isn't being the church, I hear. Or, or something to that effect. And I find it interesting that typically it's Christians who are, are completely disengaged from the local church that bash the local church. Typically, those who aren't doing anything to correct some of the problems they observe. But with all the problems that exist with, with many local congregations... Why in the world would any of us be surprised that problems exist in the local church, right? I mean, there are full of a bunch of sinners like me, and the church has had problems since its inception. Do you realize that? Many dream of, you, know, you hear this all the time, let's go back to the early church, right? The first century church. Oh, 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 you know, and, and I understand what they're, what they're saying when they say things like that. But you don't think they had problems? I mean, have you read the New Testament, right? Many who dream of that, I wonder if they've ever read 1 Corinthians, or Galatians, or, I mean, did you hear about that time where you see Paul, this church leader, calling out this other church leader, Peter, for his hypocrisy? I mean, that was that's a pretty intense little exchange, and, and not to mention there's a, a lot of people getting their heads chopped off, I mean, the 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 local church, the first century church, had its, had its issues, had its challenges going on. And, and yeah, some of those challenges still happen. So I'm calling today a tale of two sets of churches. What do you see in the New Testament 
when you examine Paul's letters, you, you find an interesting little observation here that, that Thessalonians and Philippians have very similar tones and that Corinthians and Galatians have similar tones. And, and, and there are some obvious contrasts between these two sets of churches. And why is that? Well, it's because of why Paul was writing to them. But Don't miss this. But what remains the same in all four, with all four of these churches, is God's love for the church. And Paul's presumption that, as we've already said, that the local church is where we best experience God, community, and mission. I want you to see that. Even, the, even in the Pauline letters where things are just not going well, there is still the presumption from Paul that in this local church that has its dysfunctions, that the best place for Christians to experience God, community, and mission is within the context of the local church. And I want to show you why today. The churches in Galatia and Corinth have some major issues in their church. And it leads Paul to use some very harsh yet warranted language. To the Galatian church, he says, You foolish Galatians, because of how they've been taken away by doctrines that compromise foundational principles. He, he, he speaks furiously towards the sexual immorality and idolatry that's taking place within the Corinthian church. But, but with the churches at Thessalonica and Philippi, you see such commending language. In fact, if you have your Bible, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians 1.8. And this, this almost makes me, I, I, I laugh, I remember, in preparation at, at, at this verse. He says, 1 Thessalonians 1.8, For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. Did you hear that? He commends the Thessalonians' work when he writes, Your faith toward God has gone forth so that we have no need to say anything. Imagine if he followed it up with, because let me tell you about some of these other people and some of these other issues. My goodness. I mean, he, he, he thanks the Philippian church for their participation in the gospel. In, in Galatians 1, sorry, in, in Philippians 1 5, he says, he says, because of your partnership, verse 3, I, I thank my God and all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. So we have a, a, a lot of positives to say about the Philippian church and the Thessalonian church and a whole bunch of issues to address in the Corinthian church and in the Galatian church. But here's what's fascinating. Is that throughout all four of these letters, there is the understanding, no matter the issue, the local church is where we best experience God, community, and mission. For all four of these places, don't miss this, the, the, the purpose is still the same. Again, here Paul presupposes that if you're a Christian, you engage in the local church. Not engaging is not an option despite all the issues. So first, I want to flesh this out a little more. First, it's where we best experience God. In each of these letters, what does Paul call them? Saints. Saints, even to the Corinthian church. Look, look at what he what's he, look at what he says they're experiencing. Turn with me to First Corinthians, chapter one, and look look at what they're experiencing. E even 
in the chaos of the Corinthian church. He says, starting in verse 4, he says, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. That in every way you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God because of these people. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul even uses the same, the same imitator language for the Corinthian church that he uses for the Thessalonians. In, in, in all four letters, Paul says how he is thankful for them. In the same letter when Paul says, you foolish Galatians, he refers to them as my beloved. My, my children, he says in Galatians 4.19. Brothers. He still exhorts the Galatians and the Corinthians and encourages them in their experience Experience with God and their worship of God, and that they are indeed experiencing Him together. And that's in all four letters. Why? Because Paul knew, despite the issues that exist, that God's purpose for His people to best experience Him was, was in their gathering, in their ecclesia, in their one another. Which brings me to where. We best experience community. Where we best experience community. You know, most, most Americans say that you can live a, a flourishing Christian life without being part of a church at all. And, and all I can say is that is based on a view of God that must be made out, up out of your head because the real God just is not at like that. I mean, he, he is community. Psalm 22.3 says he inhabits the praises of his people. People. Do you see that? He, he inhabits us collectively. It's, it's glory come down. In, in 1 Peter 2.5, we're, we're being built together. The first time God says... Something was not good was in Genesis 2.18 when he said it was not good for man to be alone. Tim Chester in his book, Total Church, he says, you can no more have a relationless person than you can have a childless mother or a parentless son. When Paul calls these people saints, here's something you need to know. All but like one time in the New Testament, there, there's collective, plural, not, not singular language with Christians. In 1 Peter 2.5, if you turn with me there. 1 Peter 2.5. He says, you yourselves like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Notice what he says. And, and, and it's present progressive tense. You, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. I mean, imagine a stone wall being built, right? Every stone built on the other. E each one vital. So here's my question for you. Are you so built into the lives of other believers in the church that if you stopped coming... Things would collapse. 
are you so built into the lives of other believers in the church that if you stopped coming, they might be missing something? There's, there's a group that something's not right. Do you relate to any believers like that? Is there, is there, is there that kind of interdependence where, where you share private struggles, exhortation, homes, possessions, practical help, burdens, everything. And notice, to the degree that you're being built together. Interdependence. That's what God inhabits, Psalm 22 says. That is how the power of the Holy Spirit increasingly comes into your life as you're built together. So it's not just having a quiet time. It's not, it's not just being alone in nature. Now some of you aren't going to like this, but you're not and I'm not following Jesus. You're not and I'm not following Jesus. If you and I are not being built into a body of believers... Now, don't misunderstand me. We are not following Jesus if we're not being built into the lives of other believers like this. And you might say, why is that the case? I could offer you a truckload of verses that we just don't have the time for today in the New Testament about how the church is supposed to function and individuals to grow. In every case... Paul presumes the gathering of the saints for a living stone to be on its own just does not compute. It just doesn't. Again, even in Galatians, there's the, there's the one another language in Galatians 5.13. All throughout the book of Acts, this, this koinonia language is spoken, this intimate fellowship, and where is it assumed? The local Church. This year, um, I had one of my mo more. I just realized I'm really behind on my. Okay, I'm doing pretty good. Good. Oh, yeah, I'm good. This year, I had one of my most proud moments as a pastor. Um, last fall, there was a um, a woman that had begun to attend our church, and um, about a month before that, she committed a, a terrible crime. And uh, she began to our church, and she became a Christian. And, uh, and her whole family began attending with us. And um, in the summer, it was time for court for this crime. And I remember going to the courtroom and walking in, and just tears well up in my eyes. Because when I look in this courtroom, the majority of the people were not courthouse employees. The majority of the people in the room weren't law enforcement officers. The majority of people in the room were people who were part of her local church. Wow. Wow. She, in her faith, was being built into the lives of believers since the moment she trusted Christ the previous fall. In her darkest times, there was the one another of the New Testament. So it's where we best experience God. It's where we best experience community. It's where we best experience his mission. In the crazy Corinthian church, Paul teaches extensively about spiritual gifts and how they are to be used and when. And what does he say? They are for, for building up the church mission. And near that same section is 1 Corinthians 9.23.
1 Corinthians 9, 22 and 23. It says, to the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all people, that, that by all means I might win some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessing. The call of 1 Corinthians 9, 22 and 23 is to do whatever it takes in community as his church to serve those around us and meet them where they are. And we're in 2 Corinthians. We're almost done turning, I promise. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19. He says, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Ministry of reconciliation is for who? Paul says, us, his church. For his church to gather and then scatter to bring his gospel and his glory to here and to the ends of the earth. In 2011, I was living in Birmingham, Alabama, and there's a, a church there. And um, that, that ultimately recognized the biblical mandate to care for vulnerable children. And so uh, their church saw the extraordinary need in the foster care system of Shelby County, Alabama. I mean, just tons of kids and, and few families ready to take those kids in. And this church one day, again, burdened by the gospel, burdened by a community in need. So I bet we could put a dent in that cra- you know, huge number of kids that desperately need a foster family. And so they, they set a time to invite families to come, cast this vision Looked at the, the, the church being called as the, the best, place to, best place to experience God, community, and ultimately his mission. They gathered together one afternoon, had, had DFAX workers there to begin the process of getting these families licensed. You know what happened that day? What happened is for a moment, and I don't know how long this lasted, in 2011... There was a time when in Shelby County, Alabama, a metropolitan area, there were not children waiting for families. There were families waiting for children. The church, his church, was so ensconced with his mission that there were more parents willing to take kids than there were even kids in the county who needed parents. Is that extraordinary? I mean, imagine de fact <laughs> the, the state being desperate for the local church to do what she's called to do. Tim Keller says, he said, there are some hands out there that only you can hold. There are some needs that only you can meet. There are certain people for you to be the healing agent of his grace in their lives. We have a mission that warrants urgency. The local church, his gathering. This this has never changed for God. It was Israel in the Old Testament and the church in the New. God's gathered people is the primary means by which we best experience his mission of proclaiming the glory of God to the ends of the earth. 
The church is plan A, and there is no plan B. So, what are we waiting for? What are you waiting for? Join the local church to best experience God, community, and mission. You live here now. Welcome. There's no, more, there's no more waiting around. If for no other reason, in my last, embrace the local church because you need it and he is worth it. A recent tweet I saw, I love Twitter. Isn't it great? Oh, man. A recent tweet I saw from a friend said, don't go to church to be entertained. Don't go to meet a social quota. Don't go to keep God happy. Don't go because you happen to feel like it. Go because you need it. You need your brothers and sisters, and they need you. Go because the Savior you share is worth it. There are those of you in this room that attend my church. I can't tell you how grateful I am for you. There's a sense in which, for some people in this room, whew, that if you stopped attending, I feel like I'd be missing something. If you're part of a local church, any local church in this community, let me encourage you that your engagement is critical. Your ministry there that you're engaged in, it matters. It matters. Your participation is sanctifying for you and those around you. If you are not yet part of a local church or in this community, let me employ you, implore you, not employ you, maybe, I don't know, implore you, join. If for no other reason, as my friend Aaron said, even though you may not immediately know, if you're a Christian, you need it. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you so much for the body of believers gathered here. I pray that we would be so compelled by your word and what we see from these four churches and Paul's letters to them, that it is imperative that we join to best experience you, join other believers, and be on mission to further your gospel. We love you, and we ask this in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Good word. A great word. Thank you, Wesley. Almost every time we gather, we always close with what's called a benediction. Believe it or not, a benediction is not a dismissal. It's actually a time when we take one more opportunity. We say, what have we done? What have we heard this morning? And how do we as a people walk through these doors back into our lives, whether it be on campus or in the local community? How can we go and be the people of God? I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. To begin to envision how the local church is a part of your ability, all right? a part of your giving of yourself to what God is up to in the world. Maybe tomorrow night, or I guess it's tonight, Wednesday evening would be a great time to visit. Maybe you might not be all that up to doing it alone. So maybe getting with a friend and saying, are you a part of a local community? If so, can I maybe go with you this week? So I don't just have to show up on my own. Whatever you need to do as you walk out these doors today, give yourself to walking into additional doors in this community, the local church, and to really begin your journey of growing with that local community as well as participating in that local community in a way that you can be a part of what God is doing in the world. So as we go from this place, Let's go and let's do that. See you all.